Hi folks, it's myself again. Surprise, surprise, I'm still doing these bloody videos. I'm sure you're loving them just as much as I'm loving making them. Anyway, uh, before I start, let me remind you that this week it's just the one video at the beginning of the week. And on Wednesday, as per the email, Zoom conference class. That's one where I need you there. If you cannot make it, email me ahead of time. If you don't email me ahead of time, you don't get the participation credit for it. So email me ahead of time if you're not going to be there or if you're there and you can't get through email me and so I know that there's like difficulties and I can figure out what's going wrong. I am aware. It starts at 10.30. Idea is to conclude it by 11.30 and then have anybody who wants to have questions or anything like that after. So join me at 10.30. Remember you don't have to leave your house probably to do this. Anyway, uh, hello, how are yous? Anything exciting happen? No, of course not. It's called quarantine time. Of course there's nothing happening. Um, if there is, though, do tell me. Do tell me now. Pause it. Got out of your system? Good, 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 good. Right, anyway. Today we're going to be talking a bit about contemporary theatre. I say this again to reiterate the difference between the modern era and the contemporary era. And the modern era is a mess. Like I was saying last week, there's none of this runs nearly as linear as we teachers try to make it or historians try to make it because it sounds good that it's linear. It sounds like it makes sense. Oh, of course, that makes perfect sense. The modern era ended in 1951 on the 23rd of July. And from the 24th of July onwards, all work that was still modern was disregarded as being worthless. Doesn't work like that. It's different from place to place. It kind of kicks off in some ways the way that the previous era, the modern era did. The contemporary era, by the way, it'll be called something different in years to come. We will figure it out. It's kind of like the way that we're calling them uh, Generation Z now. But in 20 years time, we'll call them something else. Millennials were called Gen Y for a good while. Gen Xers are the only ones who never got to actually have their own name. Uh, but uh, yeah, similarly in 70 years time, 80 years time, maybe we will describe this era as being the, I don't know, the digital era, the uh, information era, the fake news era. I have no idea. And there's your first little thing for the day. Tell me what era you think this should be called. That's right. Tell me the era you think that this should be called because I would be interested to know, I don't know. Contemporary means basically just of the time of which we're speaking. So a contemporary of Shakespeare's would be Ben Jonson, a contemporary of yours would be me, a contemporary of uh, Neil Armstrong would be, I don't know, Richard Nixon, people of the same era and of the same era. So this is a contemporary age and we're looking at contemporary theater but who knows in 60, 70 years time, which is the theater that we will continue to focus on, which is the stuff that will have lasted. When all the uh, modernists were being lauded in the theatrical world for their realism and their, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Their naturalism. There was also a lot of people doing stuff that became more relevant now. There were people trying experiments with stuff ahead of their time. Again, it's a mishmash. None of these things are, are a straight line. Uh, I'll get Kenneth to put up a, a graphic in a few minutes to explain that. And that's a reference that non-contemporary viewers who are not from this area won't get. If you actually, whoops, let, let, let's see if I have a whole body. If you heard, hear that reference in Kentucky in 2020, you'll know the reference to Kenneth with the graphic is to do with the governor, or you're more likely to know that, it's to do with the governor's uh, evening chats where he basically gets Kenneth to put up a graphic almost always of Philadelphia and St. Louis in 1918. But Kenneth is a reference that uh, only we will get. Somebody from Ireland will not get that reference. Somebody from 1942 will not get that reference. And so it is while these things, these current plays, these current TV shows, feel like, yeah, no, these are really easy to understand. Why could they, uh, the people of old, not make things so much more easy to understand? 
we have to acknowledge that. I'm sure the Greeks with their comedies were laughing around the place about different things, but those references don't mean anything to us anymore. And so it's not as funny. That's contemporary for you. Let's have a quick look at the contemporary world and how it changed. So I normally say modernism kind of, uh, in, in general, went up to the interwar period, to the beginning of World War II. Theatre, it's a little bit different, and particularly over here. And that's because over here is different to the rest of the world. World War II changed everything for most of the world. Throughout Asia, World War II started in 1935 and continued to 1946, basically. And then there were ramifications coming from the Chinese Civil War between the Communists and the uh, Imperialists, which meant that kind of, in some cases, it even pushed on to 1950. Their World War II happened at a different time to ours. For most of Europe, for my lot, which, by the way, we, in Ireland we didn't join the war, so we didn't describe it as a war, we described it as an emergency. But World War II, it, for most of Europe, started in 1939 and continued to 1945. In Africa, it started about 1941, 1942, it's when it really kicked off, and went to about 1944. Throughout most of the world, except the Americas, uh, World War II was a massive impact. North America's only real impact, uh, effect, uh, experience of World War II was the bombing of Honolulu, which is practically from here to California, away from California. Uh, Australia even got bombed. The northern cities got uh, shelled by the Japanese. So even they had some impacts, much less than most of the rest of the world. South America, I believe, I think it was World War II, that there was a battle in the harbour by Buenos Aires and uh, Montevideo between um, Argentina and Uruguay. But that was it. Uh, their, effect, their World War II happened afterwards when people came along in, let's say, uh, no longer wearing Nazi uniforms, we'll put it that way. So what really happened that changed everything? For a start, not one household on the continent of Europe was left completely untouched. Even countries who, that were uh, supposedly neutral, like Switzerland and Sweden, they had strong Nazi interference, which kept them neutral. In Ireland, we were very much affected by it because many Irish went to fight in World War II. We, as a nation, did not join World War II because we'd only just gotten out of a war with Britain and to join a war on the same side as Britain was to invite a whole lot of trouble. And to join against Britain was to invite Britain in and that wouldn't have been good either. Uh, so throughout much of the world, this world war was essentially, a, in some parts, a colonial war. And so everywhere the colonies touched, there was destruction. Above and beyond that was the incredible and mind-numbing experience the, uh, for Jewish people. The Holocaust, whether you were anywhere near that part of Europe or not, has affected what it is to be Jewish, what it is to continue. And a lot of people describe it as the end of history. That how can there be history after such an epochal event? as the Holocaust. We get to a place where the world is different. In the light of this war, the mass of European and non-European, not looking at the United States by any chance, the mass of superpowers who were damaged by it, France, Spain to a degree, Portugal certainly, Germany to a minor degree, uh, and, and Belgium and so on and so forth, they were weakened men. They were having mocked Turkey in the 19 teens as being the sick man of Europe. The rest of Europe was pretty sick. If it wasn't for Marshall Plan money from the United States and common turn uh, money from the Soviet Union, most of Europe would pretty much be still in the doldrums. This was an opportunity for many nations. Much as Ireland took World War I as an opportunity to revolt against Britain, most of the colonies did the same thing at this point. Many of them gaining independence, often by the gun, often with, uh, sometimes without the need to. They were released for fear of uh, the homeland having to support them. And in most cases, it led almost directly into a civil war. It happened in Ireland too. 
most nations, when they gain independence uh, after years of oppression, descend into civil war as the structures that are maintaining order are gone. This happened in Iraq and also is currently happening in Syria. The likes of Libya, Tunisia, um, Morocco, not so much, but certainly, as we can see, in Syria. These are changing. They're gaining independence. They're gaining a new world. We have the rise of the small nation, which I put sort of laughingly in there. The rise of the small nation is the rise of many, many massive nations, far greater than their uh, former colonial overlords in terms of size and population, but somehow oppressed from, uh, from distance. But these small nations, which are still often treated as small nations, they now had an opportunity to speak to themselves from themselves, to self-govern. When the civil war, the inevitable civil war, is over, they now, we can hear, unheard and underheard voices for the first time and the opportunity for the development of their cultures. Even in Europe, little Europe, a lot of countries that were essentially uh, satellite states start to come into their own. Luxembourg becomes an actual country in a real sense. Uh, throughout Eastern Europe, we have changes in uh, governance as well. Things change. We have throughout Africa and Asia, and to a lesser degree South America, these rises of different nationalisms. Even the Caribbean, where Britain basically holds sway to a great degree still, and certainly did back then, we have a degree of movement towards at least self-rule, home rule, uh, where we didn't uh, before. Throughout, whether it's uh, a first world country, by which I mean a country in the sphere of influence or an ally with the United States. A second world country, those nations that are under thrall to uh, the Soviet Union and to a much lesser degree China. Or a third world nation, nations who remain neutral, which eventually became a pejorative term for developing nations as we now call them, which in itself is somewhat pejorative. Ireland was one of these, but so too would be nations like um, Nigeria or Chad or any of these many nations who aren't really aligned. Within all these nations, we have new voices, new expression, and pretty much everywhere there's elements of repression. Now, normally, if I've got a more uh, pale-faced audience than this, we will see people thinking immediately of the Soviet Union and the Soviet Union sphere. Places like Poland, Hungary, the Czech, uh, Czechoslovakia, where people were fearful of speaking out loud for fear of dis uh, being uh, imprisoned for dissent. We had that here in the United States too. And in a different way and a much friendlier face. Anybody who isn't white knows this. Many people who are white would do well to learn this. Because if you are a dissenting minority, you are brushed under the carpet. Which is why we have this... I don't know, uh, nostalgia for the 1950s. If you were a good, straight, Christian, white, uh, capitalist guy, the world was great. If you were a woman in any denomination, if you're any kind of uh, non-heterosexual, non-white um, non person, and certainly if your politics uh, swung differently to capitalism, you are not a uh, welcome person in this nation. There's arguments to say that you aren't still, but I leave that for somebody else to debate. I'm not even a citizen here, so I don't have a voice. Anyway, we get to a place where the way of doing things is not a, no longer enough. We don't have, we can't go back with such change to how things were. If you like, it's Strindberg's uh, uh, argument about pouring new wine into the old bottles. The new wine will burst these old bottles apart. The new ideas that people are having will burst these bottles apart, these ideas of realism and naturalism. So we have, broadly speaking, and I'm very aware I'm trying to create a picture, create a story of how this works, which isn't direct. We have, broadly speaking, a number of people in many countries moving to do something different except in countries that weren't really affected by the war. 
Ireland doesn't do much changing. The United States doesn't do much changing in how we operate our drama. Indeed, the classic Abbey style of drama was still prevalent right up until the 1990s, the early 2000s. It was dominant. Slightly Stanislavskian in influence, thanks to movies, but the same. Similarly so here. The method that started being taught in the 1930s, the Stanislavski that was brought over in the late 1920s, the taste for Chekhovian realism, Chekhovian naturalism, these are still the way. Partly that's influenced by TV and what have you, but that's a peculiarity to hear. If you go into the Soviet Union where every script had to be read before it was performed, writers started and directors started getting ingenious and needing to try and figure out a new way of uh, operating their theatre and putting in things in code or, as is still the case, doing things physically. You can't read words that aren't written down. So if the message was, I'm so glad to see you, my friend, and it was performed like, I'm so glad to see you, my friend. I'm so happy to see that the leader is respected everywhere. You get a different message. So that's a rough overview. We come to this world. We come to this need for contemporary theatre, need for a different kind of theatre. Honestly, the world changed. And you will see, when you look at the history of American theatre, emancipation or civil rights changes elements of theatre. The African-American theatre develops a new wing. And again, I need to stress that modernism isn't going away. Realism, naturalism, they're going to be here with us for life, as is melodrama. And there's nothing wrong with any of them, though people get uh, snooty about whichever one they don't like or whichever one they do like. But the reality is, we're going to continue to have modernism alongside a complete tranche of different kind of contemporary uh, experimental, as we tend to call them, uh, avant-garde, as we would have called them in Europe, and um, different ways of expressing a theatrical need. I'll mention a couple of them in a little bit. A part of this, or at least a major part of this, was a development towards uh, seeing theatre with purpose. Gone are the sense of, yeah, theatre should just be an entertainment in Europe and in many communities around the world. In Africa, theatre is no longer for entertainment. Theatre is a motivator. It is an agitator. In France, it had become the therapeutic tool and so on and so forth. So I'm going to look at a number of uses for theatre that came up in this period as we start to see of theatre as being possibly more than just an entertainment. Here we are again. So drama as tool or theatre as tool. We often use these words interchangeably. Uh, I remember being involved in different drama and education projects and different theatre and education projects and there was a definition why they were different. I, I don't remember. There are three major uses for drama outside of entertainment. And these are the three major ones we see happening a lot today. A therapeutic use, where we help people to come to terms with what has happened. An educational use, where we help people to learn things, to explore the world in a different way. And there's a political use, where we help people to see how things can be different. Let's have a look at therapeutic use. You can read all this, you can pause it and have a read. But the important thing is, when people have lost the ability to operate the way they did, sometimes drama can be used in that, that therapeutic way to help them regain that ability. I don't mention it there, but Gestalt therapy, which is kind of a, um, a psychi uh, not psychiatry, um, psychoanalysis of a, of a, to a degree. Uh, gestalt therapy has you basically sit down and place whoever you need to be talking to in the chair opposite you. If you have unresolved issues with your father, but he's died, putting an imaginary father in the chair beside you can really assist and make more sense than just to talk openly like, blah, 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 I feel unhappy. What would you say to your father? This is, without telling people who are going through it, 
a real acting thing that we use. This idea, again, you could argue it's the magic if, you could argue it's the uh, method. It is uh, relating to your issues by corporealizing them and engaging with them. I will talk about therapeutic drama a little bit later. Educational drama, again, you can read all this. Like I said, remember those guys who came out, out to your school to tell you not to do drugs? I'd actually do this for a living some of the time. I work with the Commonwealth Theatre Centre who have the Blue Apple Players, uh, who are a theatre education group. We go out to different schools. Most recently, I was teaching history through educational uh, drama, basically. Um, I've also done different things, helping people to learn resilience and to deal with bullying and all these other kinds of things. It can be fun. It can also be cringy. The Hey Kids, Don't Do Drugs uh, show that came to our school had people older than me in it. And they're like, you're not a teenager, mate. I do not believe you. The good ones will always do better stuff. The poor ones will do less. I do want to refer to on the bottom the Forum Theatre. There's a guy called Augusto Boal who does a th who did a thing called Theatre of the Oppressed. He's Brazilian. He worked a lot with the different uh, minorities and impoverished people and oppressed peoples of Brazil and then around the world. One of the things we've been doing lately, or I've been doing work-wise lately, is Forum Theatre. and it's, it's fantastic stuff. I used to do this 20 years ago, dealing with uh, issues to deal with the end of the Civil War in Northern Ireland. And basically it's a thing where you run a story which ends with a lockdown and a very unsatisfying lockdown that nobody's going to budge an inch. And then you ask the audience, hey, let's stop the play at an appropriate time and ask somebody, and you can come in and either say what needs to happen or take the part of that person and try and change the narrative, change the direction of how this is going. It's wonderful stuff. Uh, if any of you go on to work in education in community, in a, particularly in a community sense, you'll come across Augusto Boal and Paolo Freire, wonderful writers. Freire is more about um, pedagogy of the oppressed. And he's, he is the bedrock of a lot of um, educational drama, particularly when you're dealing with uh, minorities, dealing with minority issues, dealing with the issues of people who are in an oppressed situation dealing with what it's like to be an outsider, what it's like to be ra uh, racially abused, and so on and so forth. Things, fortunately, for the most part, I don't endure, but this has helped me understand more, and that's partly why I work in this, because, you know, I want to give something back. There's the white man's burden for you. Let's move on from that disgusting rubbish. Political theatre, not party-based, although, you know, you can get that but it's more to do with advocating points or exploring questions and the small p of politics. Um, you can read all this. The ones that do come to mind are some of the local ones. Uh, groups like uh, Pandora here particularly, which tends to speak on two fronts politically. They explore LGBTQ matters uh, they, and explore uh, queer identities. Sec uh, it matters to do with sexuality and uh, gender identity. And partly that is educating the public and bringing it to public mind. Partly that is speaking it out loud and saying, you know, we are here and we have a voice. Partly it's to do with entertaining, being in a safe space. And again, people who are of any minority throughout the world, wherever you go, even if you're a majority elsewhere, that sense of a desire for a safe space, a place where you and your voice can be heard and be treated with respect and not abused. It's vital. There are so many. There's probably more political theatre companies uh, than play performing theatre companies these days. Um, as I said, there's a variety. There have been numerous ones uh, for whatever community you want to talk of. Teatro Tercera Yamada, which is the Spanish language company here, uh, similar to Faithworks, they aren't overtly political. In, in mo many ways, their political act is creating a theatre space for the people who fit that community. And it's vital. It's especially in a world where TV and movies are overwhelmingly white. 
you have to pick the special channel in order to get the stuff that speaks to you. Being able to have that space in our city is good for our city as well as for the communities. I will also bring attention to the fact that it's not always in theatres, sometimes it's sort of a part of a protest. I remember during the Bush era, George II, not one, uh, there was a big protest about, I can't remember if it's a G8 summit or something like that, and there were a number of people outside the protest going, hell no, we mu you must go, and things like that, all the chants, all the various different political things. But there was another bunch of people, about 15 or 20 of them, all dressed up like the Monopoly billionaire, you know, the uh, rich guy on the Monopoly thing? They were all dressed up kind of like that, and they were saying, um, you know, uh, re-elect Cheney and sort of making a mockery of the fact that they felt it was a government by uh, uh, money rather than a government by democracy. So always interesting in the political theatre. So we get to a place where today we have these three kinds of theatre. We have had a lot of change. I've talked about the change, and aside from these useful theatres, there, uh, there are a couple of places in how they're used. First up, I'm going to look at the therapeutic use, and how that has become more than just a therapy, and it's become an entire style of theatre. So after the war in France, with between shell shock, uh, injury, and so much horror, the French people were not a unified group nor were they all well. Many, many people, hundreds, thousands of people, simply could not speak. They could not communicate anymore. Sometimes it was physiological, but a lot of the times it was psychological. At this point, we get a guy called Jacques Lecoq. He's one of my favorite uh, uh, theater thinkers, and not just for the name. Lecoq uh, was a French gym teacher. He and an associate who was a professional French basketball player, yes, they had them then, uh, they worked together to try to bring their talents and their, their abilities to bear on helping people recover. And the physiological side of things, they had down. We're talking gym teacher and a professional basketball player. They know what they're doing. They realized that wasn't enough, that the psychological issues that were often as big a barrier as the physiological. So they hit upon a way of theatre of doing it. They, they decided to try and get people to become performers. Now, this is a side note. You'll often find, in a really bizarre way, that several people who have stutters or they have difficulty being clear, suddenly when they're playing a part, the stutter is gone. I have a friend who's an actor, wonderful actor. Takes a while sometimes for him to get out sentences because he will sometimes stutter over the beginning. But when he's on stage, there's no stutter. I've oftentimes been acting in a show when I've got a cold or a flu or so, well, maybe not a flu, but a cold or a bad cold. And you know, those kind of colds where you're just kind of coughing the whole time. I have been backstage coughing, 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 dreading going on stage because I knew the cough was continuing. And then the moment I step on stage, the cough is gone. I've never coughed on stage when I wasn't meant to, and I don't know why. It's a psychological thing. When you're per performing the part of somebody else, something else takes over. Using their physicality and their understanding of theatre, the cock managed to developed this style of very physical movement where every word comes with some kind of gesture or movement that may, now they would be fluid, they wouldn't be. Every word comes with nothing like that. We're talking about fluidity of uh, movement and word together. As they go along, this kind of becomes a company. Some of these people who have been so badly injured that they've had to go, come to these guys for help they stay along and they perform plays. After a few years, maybe 10 years after uh, the war ends, it's really a theatre school now and not a, a, a centre for therapy. Numerous different theatres throughout the world, like Théâtre de Complicité, um, oh, what's the name, uh, Cirque du Soleil, uh, Fusbarn, 
and so many more have drawn inspiration from and studied at L'Ecole Lecoq. L'Ecole meaning school. Lecoq actually means the rooster, so get those filthy minds out of your, uh, filthy thoughts out of your minds. Um, so many people have studied there and they bring something very different whenever they come back to whatever their country is. In Ireland in particular, where we had very, very stagey, oh no, I've got words that are poetical and I'll say them now while looking out but not moving. I can move now because I've got no words. I'll just walk to the other side of the stage. And now I'll finish my speech with grand poetical declamation. We get people back from Lecoq and it's like, ooh, you don't act like anybody else. And it's helped to enrich Irish theatre greatly. But it's also been something that has been jarring by times. There are a number of Americans have studied at Lecoq, but not nearly as many. Again, TV and movies are God here, and you haven't had that same uh, World War II experience. The experience here comes a little later. So people like Lecoq are creating this new dynamic of theatre, uh, more movement-based in some cases. In uh, places like uh, the Czech Republic, it is illegal to perform plays that have not been publicly vetted in a the theatre which means that people are now starting to perform plays in living rooms or people are submitting plays, they're vetted, but the vetting deals only with the words they say, not with the emotions they feel or the performance they do. In order to counter what's going on, we have new styles developing. Go to continental Africa, continental Asia. The Western styles are now being rejected or maybe not rejected again we go, I go into that make that mistake of creating an idea this was the way until this date and then it was all this they're still performed that way but we're also seeing people trying to incorporate more and more of their cultural identity uh, throughout if you like that's a political use a political way of speaking I am from wherever I am and this is how we do things this is our tradition this is the world I want my theatre to be. In another sense, I'm going to look at a guy who, again, proves the point I make that there wasn't a specific date at all changed. A guy called Bertolt Brecht. When the world was still doing the theatre of the old ways, the naturalism, the realism, Brecht was starting to divine and create his own stuff. He felt strongly that he wanted to do something completely unique and different to everybody else. You could argue, check out the ego on that guy, but in fairness, he had a good point. He felt that a lot of the plays that were being performed publicly really only spoke to the middle classes. He really enjoyed, when he was younger, the music halls. Music halls was a kind of theatre that, throughout the modern era, was hugely popular. It's kind of like a variety show. You would go to your local music hall and at seven o'clock you'd get your first act on and maybe they'd pay, perform for 10 minutes and then maybe you have a singer for five and then you get a comedian on for 15 minutes. Then you maybe you get an, a, a scene from a play. Then you've probably got a magician or a juggler or God knows what. There's somebody coming out spinning plates. Here's a woman on a tricycle or a unicycle who's playing the trumpet. This kind of entertainment mix em gather em variety show was something he felt reached ordinary people. So he wanted to do the theatre of the messages, the political theatre, and he felt that this was a way of doing it. So in the late 20s, the 30s, he's performing this kind of stuff. Now, from his point of view, I, be I can't remember whether or not he was married to a Jewish woman, but he considered himself communist. In, Soviet Germ uh, sorry, in Nazi Germany, this was not acceptable. So he continued, he uh, escaped out of there into Denmark, got out of Denmark just before the Nazis got into there and escaped to Sweden. When he got to Sweden, it was a case of, ooh, here they come. And the Germany, uh, Germany invaded Sweden peacefully, by which it means they didn't invade officially, but all of a sudden there's a lot of German soldiers on the streets because, you know, Sweden has uh, resources that Germany can use. He ran from Sweden into the Soviet Union, crossed the Soviet Union, which he felt some disdain for. I don't think he had a lot of time for Stalin and ended up in the United States. When in the United States, he was safe for a few years before, uh, shortly after the war, 
the House on american Activities uh, Committee brought him up to uh, Washington to have a chat, to up to D.C., for when they said, are you a communist? He said, oh, oh no, 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 that, that, that wouldn't be me. Within six months, he'd left and gone back to Soviet East Germany, where he opened a theatre and was successful for about five years before dying quite young. His ideas were important. Firstly, that the theatre should be a place of entertainment and enjoyment, but also that that's a good time to do some messages, to have people understand and appreciate what you have to say. He had this idea of Verfremdung's effect, which is called the alienation effect. It's the German word for it. Like all Germans, they have weird words for everything. But the alienation effect was very much designed to have people go, oh, well, I'm in the theatre, so I won't get drawn into this drama. I'm going to get focused on what's, what does this mean? We'd have people walk out like ring girls at the beginning of a boxing match in the 1970s, holding up a card saying, this scene is about this, or whatever. All the time he would draw attention to the fact that this is theatre. Don't get subsumed, don't get consumed by this. He hated melodrama and he was antithetical. He, was, he wasn't a big fan of uh, naturalism or realism, but he, what he really wanted to do was to get people thinking, I am watching a play. And I'm here, and I'm enjoying myself, but I'm aware of these ideas that are going on. Among some of the plays he had, uh, I'm particularly fond of the Caucasian Chalk Circle, which is uh, almost like an early version of Forum Theatre. He outlines a difficult uh, journey for a woman trying to protect a child, and asks us to answer the question, how could this have been better? He starts it by having people in the two communities come together and talking, and then they tell this story to try and resolve their problems. Another famous one he has is Mother Courage and Her Children, which is about a woman who is basically uh, a black marketeer during the, the Thirty Years' War. Um, she goes back and forth, she loses children to the war, uh, both in terms of them being taken as honest soldiers and being killed, and all the time sort of in pursuit of, uh, in pursuit of a dime. Is she a winner? Is she a loser? Hard to say. But it is a play that kind of does feel timely every now and again quite hard. So, that's a little bit about where we got to theatrically speaking. I'm going to focus on a specific country and a specific minority that still hasn't got equal rights, but has had a big movement. And they've got, got to a place where, while they may not have equal rights, they have a lot more respect uh, throughout. And their culture has uh, flourished and developed greatly. This country is, of course, the United States of America. And the civil rights movement, as I'm sure you know backwards, uh, in the 1950s and 60s, and arguably up to the current day, uh, were incredibly vital. Jim Crow had taken a supposedly, a purportedly freed race and without enslaving it, put it under, put it in shackles. How do we as a people react to our oppression? We revolt, we develop our community, we develop our culture. I speak, I speak of that as somebody Irish looking back into the past, into the 19, 1890s through to the 1930s. Arguably, we've, we're really only 20 or 30 years out of the echo of that. How does that happen in the United States? Firstly, we have movements in churches, we have movements in culture, we have movements on the street, and we have movements in communities. The black arts movement of the 70s uh, changed the dynamic. It paved the way for what's going on in Atlanta. It paved the way for the likes of Lynn Nottage, who, while I would say is definitely not 
as experimental as some of the people in that movement is a byproduct. It's all, what she's got to do, the amazing work she's done, is only possible thanks to this, this movement, this uprising of culture, among other things, in the, in the 50s and 60s. I'll look at it through uh, one of the more important characters of the time, Ntozake Shange. She's a writer, poet, and artist. She was born in uh, New Jersey and lived most of her life in Brooklyn, major figure within the black arts movement. She was gifted. She was there when busing started, and she lived through it. Uh, she uh, got made to take the... Uh, she got put on the bus to go to the desegregated white school in New Jersey. And then eventually they moved to New, uh, St. Louis, and it was the same thing again. She was incredibly talented and gifted, ingenious, a good writer, and a great eye. Where she comes to my attention is in the 1970s, when she moves back to, back to the East Coast, to Brooklyn. Uh, particularly in 1975, she moves to Brooklyn, she gets involved in a ton of work, and she writes her best-known play for coloured girls who have considered suicide when the rainbow is enough. This play you may have seen translated into a movie uh, by a guy called Tyler Perry. He does a decent attempt on adapting it because it's, it's so hard to adapt. This isn't a play as you would understand it. Now, you remember me talking about Strindberg and the new bottles will break the old wine, so we need to do different things. In the preface to her play for Coloured Girls, she talks about it being a choreo, a choreo poem. I could be pronouncing that wrong. C-H-O-R-E-O-P-O-E-M. A choreo poem she describes as a dramatic expression that combines poetry, dance, music and song. She is with this play, and in the preface to this play, basically creating a manifesto for what should theatre be. What should the theatre of her people be? Again, I don't want to make it sound like you people, her people, that kind of thing. But when it's coming from a white guy, it's going to sound like that. So, you know, I have to suck it up. Her idea of the choreo, uh, choreo poem is that it's a representative of what African-American culture is. Uh, it's an attempt to depart from the way things have been, that Western um, culture and tradition of theatre, of storytelling, of poetry. Uh, the idea is that it's not, you know, very plot driven, which is why it's interesting to watch the translation of the play. The play tells stories. The movie tries to tell a story, if that makes sense. The key isn't on the story, it's getting that human experience through. Shange wants us to listen, to take it in, and to emote, to feel what the people she's speaking of feel. It's not about this happens, then this happens, then this happens. It's a case of this is who my life is. And it's powerful stuff. Uh, she's not the only writer of choreo poems. There have been a number, including, and I have to look at my list here, Peter Schaefer, Tom Krasinski, S. Ann Johnson, uh, and others. She's written a few, though. Um, spell number seven, or spell hashtag seven, as I presume you guys would put it these days, is one of them. A photograph is another. Boogie Woogie Landscapes and Daddy Says. They're just some of the ones that are referenced. Uh, and it's not just in theatre. It also takes place in different places. Partly, this is outlining what an African-American culture is, or what it can be. Again, I don't have to say, 400 years ago, folks came over here and were told to cast their religion, their culture, their language, their identity off them. This is one step towards pulling it back, to creating their own, or to, and, and, and that's as she understood it. The play itself, like the other, like the movie, has seven main characters, seven women who've suffered, seven women who are dealing with 
the way life is. And this is again 1975. So if you like, arguably we are what a few years into the post civil rights world. That civil rights world continues in my mind to this day uh, in many ways. But uh, she creates this play, this choreo poem that gets us to feel. The closest thing I've seen to it in recent years, and it disappoints me that I don't see so many of these anymore, is something like the vagina monologues, where you get a series of different stories told. In For Coloured Girls, they're really poems, but they're performed. Uh, in vagina monologues, they're stories or their personal experiences. Similarly so, arguably, women are another group that need to... Uh, as a whole, uh, decolonize the way storytelling is told or storytelling is done in order to create their own. And a lot of times, if you're black or a female or just honestly not a non-white male, it can be difficult to get your stories to the public because there is an understanding of, oh, this is what stories are meant to be. So if you want to, I'm going to see if I can root it out. It You was on YouTube for a while. There was a 1982 production of For Coloured Girls in the style she wanted to to a degree. It's made more realistic and more easy for a uh, an audience that's used to their understanding of black people that they don't know being good times. But, you know, it gives you a sense of it in a sense that... Uh, Tyler Perry expands upon but this is a little bit closer to the original idea I'm going to see if I can find it and put it up if not I'll just scrub this last little bit um, Susan Laurie Parks is another massive figure that really we should all know about because she's from here she grew up in uh, by E-Town in Fort Knox her dad was a uh, military so she spent a lot of her youth touring around the country and seeing the way the world was in so many different places. And out of this, she gets a... How would I put it? She becomes aware of a world that is more than just the basics of what it is to be um, in the Western Hemisphere. She's written quite a number of bits and pieces... But she's not by any means pin downable. Now she's only 56. She was born in the 60s. She was the first woman, who, first African American woman to win a Pulitzer Prize, which is sort of the, the big point out uh, thing over here. She won the Pulitzer Prize for her play Top Dog, Underdog. But she's very much an experimenter. She does all kinds of different explorations of things. Um, one of the plays that I always like to mention is her play, uh, 365 Plays, 365 Days, which is 365 plays of maybe one or two uh, pages long. Some of them are a little bit longer, some of them are shorter. It was a big experiment she did. Basically, the idea was to get a number of theatre companies together in order to do all these plays and take turns I think they did it 24 hours or something crazy like that. And throughout, right throughout the world. But it was a remarkable feat. Some of these plays don't really have a beginning, middle or end. Some of these plays connect up with other plays within the 365. Some are short. Some are very, very pithy. Some are really freaky. It's a little bit of everything. She's a remarkable writer and really needs to be taken uh, more seriously by modern academia. Um, she's written, uh, let me see some of the big names here. Uh, Death of the Last Black Man in the Whole Entire World, AKA The Negro Book of the Dead. It was a play that uh, took her over three years. Uh, but again, uh, the America play, uh, which follows a, an African-American grave digger who's a huge fan of Abraham Lincoln and resembles him. So he works as an African-American Abraham Lincoln impersonator. Uh, Venus, which is a play about, uh, it's set all around Europe and South Africa, 
about the woman who was known as the Venus, the Hottentop Venus. She was a woman who uh, had all the cliché um, things that were supposedly seen by Europeans as African-American, or sorry, not African, African um, sexual uh, attractiveness. Uh, she had a particularly large rear end and it's become this kind of cliché within culture. If you remember that Kim Kardashian thing from a few years ago where, uh, you know, she, there's like champagne shooting over her, that was the cliché image of her. Um, and this one actually questions A, who she was and explores her. B, it explores the history of the history. It explores how much of what we believe to be true is actually true. Again, another masterwork from her. Uh, I don't know if it was shortlisted for the Pulitzer or not, but certainly should have been. Um, plays like In the Blood, Fucking A, Top Dog, Underdog, and, uh, and so on and so forth have put her at the top. But like many people, <laughs> she, she gets her money not from writing plays. She's written a few screenplays like uh, Girl Six and Native Son, um, but she gets her money as an academic. Uh, as far as I can tell, the most of the time she is working professionally as an academic while she is trying to write. She teaches, uh, where is it she teaches? Let me look it up. I didn't note it down. Finally, the last one I want to talk about, and I only read this play recently, uh, completely unrelated, did not know she was African American when I, when I got hold of it, figured it out pretty quickly. And I've become kind of low-key obsessed with her. Uh, it's a woman called... Let me get the name right. Uh, it's a woman called uh, Jackie Sibley's Drury. She won the Pulitzer Prize in 2019 for a play called Fairview. Now, Fairview is a trick on the audience, if you like. Fairview starts off... Very simply, it looks like some kind of simple, straightforward, boring enough sitcom. It starts off very straightforward. There's a family, they're having Thanksgiving and oh, there's difficulties and, you know, there's elements of cliche. But generally the cliche is all eradicated. They feel like normal people in a sort of a sitcom -y set setting. The husband is... An ordinary guy. The wife is an ordinary woman. Honestly, if you're watching this for the first time, when I was reading it for the first time, I didn't know. I could have read those easily as being white characters. I think with the exception of one character had what sounded like a quite African-American name. Second act is the same as the first act. The play is taking place, except this time completely silent. And after a few moments, in walks some white girl. Or some millennial girl who feels very white. Somebody young, somebody who seriously seems to think she knows about what's going on and is making comments on, on the play. And then somebody, comes, somebody else comes in and they talk back and forth. And at the end, you've got four, I'm going to say, youngish white folks making comments about the play who are talking and complaining. That's yeah, it's not really what I want it to be. It's kind of like that, but you know, you don't understand what it's like to be black. And like, of course I don't. Well, you don't. These people who are watching this play, who are commenting on it, who clearly don't really have that experience. In the third act, what happens is we start just before the end of where the first act ended. And we continue on from there, this time with sound. No sign of our uh, lookers on. Because the, at this, uh, the second act, the play goes beyond what we'd seen in the first. This time we come in from where we had seen in the first. And a few minutes into it, one of those white girls comes in and all of a sudden she's being the grandmother. She's being a very regal, grand grandmother. A cliche of what white folks think a noble uh, black grandmother is. And then somebody else comes in and, oh wait, hang on, this is the brother. 
This is the brother who's a lawyer, but he's acting like yo, yo, yo. And he's uh, straight out of some kind of uh, boys in the hood type uh, idea of what black is. And then we have another character coming in. She clearly has no clue because she's like European. She has no idea of what it is to be African-American. And she's doing her take on things. And then we get uh, the, third, the fourth character comes in and she's basically she is Medea or Medea, the Tyler Perry character, trying to fit who is a character with their own value in their own place. But this isn't that place. And we have these white folks come in and manipulate the story. And the family who are already living there have to fix themselves around the way the story has been told. That the ability to tell their own story has been taken from them in order to satisfy some outsider, some white view of what their world is. So they can make sense of it on their terms. Their story is robbed from them as the play goes on. It's incredibly powerful. Fairview. Think of the name. Think of what that means and what that connotates. Fairview. It's a masterpiece. I'm desperate keen to try and get that play on stage in this uh, town. I am working on it. I am not going to direct that. You don't need some white guy directing that play. But <coughs> if you ever get a chance to see Fairview by Jackie Sibley's jury, oh my God, take that opportunity. It's, it's stunning. Um, it won her the Susan Smith Blackburn Prize. It won her the Pulitzer Prize for drama. Um, needless to say, it didn't make its way onto actual Broadway because that's a little bit too scary for people. I haven't, come, I haven't had a chance to read the, her other big play, which is called Monstrously Long. We are proud to present a presentation about the uh, Herero of Namibia, formerly known as Southwest Africa, from the Africa, German Sudwest Africa between the years 1884 and 1915. Haven't had a chance to read it or see it yet. It's uh, just getting on for eight years old. It's not been produced here. But uh, comedic, according to Wikipedia... A comedic dramatization of the forgotten Herero and uh, Namaqua genocide, which took place in Namibia when it was a German colony. Uh, so, yeah, that's definitely going to be good meat for a comedy. Um, but based on what I read of uh, her work in Fairview, this is going to be something else if we ever get the chance to see it. It sounds... I always worry that we have a situation where our major theatres who can afford to put on big works like these won't do it because, well, that's not the African-American writer we work with. Uh, Actors Theatre works very much with Dominic Morisou, who is a wonderful writer, and I'm glad that they do. But I want to see them work with other writers other than their tamed or uh, their local or the, the one that they know. Certainly... Jackie Sibley's Drury, Lynn Nottage. These are people we need to be seeing in our hometown. And bloody Susan Laurie Parks, who's from here? Haven't seen her work here in a long old time. Anyway, that is my uh, yammering on for this particular class. Bang on the hour, just about. Um, a reminder, on Wednesday, you need to show up and give in, uh, get, get on the Zoom, and we can have a proper chat. Your second mission for this class, by the way, the other thing I want you to tell me, so I know that you've seen the whole thing through, is do you know a playwright, African-American or otherwise, who I haven't mentioned? Who have I missed on the course this year? Because after this, I'm going to be talking about experimental stuff, which transcends the idea of the playwright. And I know that might seem hard for people who, are, who have an experience being lodged in the Western theatrical tradition. But what playwrights should I have mentioned? Name one, name more. Can be somebody famous, can be somebody not so famous. I'd like to know who you think. And if you don't, can't think of any playwrights, you just say, I can't think of any playwrights who you should have mentioned. That will work for me too. Anyway, at this stage, 
thanks a million for listening. There was a lot of talking, an awful lot of talking, no video. Uh, hopefully I'll have found a couple of clips of video from some of the writers I've talked about today and I'll put them in the links. Uh, otherwise, see you all on Wednesday at 10.30. Bye.